everyone's always called it top down versus step up. I like to call it early appropriate because people always go, well, top down is aggressive. And I like to call step therapy delayed inappropriate therapy. So with that, for my side of the debate, I'm going to put some explicit parameters on this. So early intervention, we should not consider aggressive, right? It's appropriate. You're trying to find the patient that's high risk for complications. We're not talking about mild Crohn's with one ileal erosion. And then I'm not going to, I'm going to exclude reasons to not use these therapies early on, meaning they have an abscess, the, the insurance says we won't pay for it, or a patient just says, I hear what you're saying, but I don't want to do it, right? Those are kind of logistical reasons not to do it. We're, I'm going to focus on the medical reasons to do it. And then with that, patients really care about risk, right? I think they all believe some therapy might be beneficial to them, but it's the risk that drives their decision. And again, this is not all IBD patients. We're going to select a group that is, quote, high risk. Everyone has seen this, right? This is how we have usually practiced, where we start with mesalamine, maybe antibiotics, budesonide, and then we say, oh, you're not doing well, or we think now you have more severe disease activity. Then we will go to a thiopurine, maybe methotrexate, prednisone. And then we kind of move up to, well, you're not responding to these. So then we go to biologics, uh, amongst other things, and a lot of these patients end up with surgery, hospitalizations, et cetera. And really, where we probably should be, and the majority of this is going to be about Crohn's disease, because I think we've defined that a little better, is we should really be talking about early intervention, which is going to be the top, right? So you have a patient who's high risk. Let's not go through steroids. Let's not talk about stepping through mesalamine and azathioprine. Um, and then let's reserve surgery for the truly refractory patients um, that are failing everything. So with that, I think we have to understand what are our goals, right? So patients care about symptoms. As you've seen, sometimes symptoms just don't correlate with what's really going on. So we do want them to improve their quality of life. And the reason I put that last is that's probably the hardest one for most of these, right? We, we want to induce remission. We want to avoid steroids, and we'll talk about why. We want to avoid complications, surgeries, hospitalizations. And then we want to maintain the remission we have. And hopefully with all of that, we might improve their quality of life. But we all have patients where we say you're in remission and they still feel poorly. Again, most people have seen this, right? Most Crohn's patients present with inflammatory disease. But over time, if inadequately treated, they will end up with stricturing disease, fibrostenotic disease, which is not amenable to medical therapy. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to stay away from that bottom side of this curve. We don't want people to turn into fibrostenotic disease. Another way to look at, at that is, well, what happens when you get fibrostenotic disease, you get penetrating disease, you end up with surgery, right? So over a prolonged period of time, if you're inadequately treating, almost all of these patients will end up with a surgical issue um, and they will require surgery in their lifetime. So this is kind of what we talked about. This is our goals these days. And so the question is then, well, who are the high-risk patients, right, in our clinics? And, you know, if you're in practice, I think there's a few easy things you can do. And one is when you see a Crohn's patient and you say, okay, you're less than 40 at time of diagnosis, you've got perianal disease, or you and the patient decided to start on steroids, well, this study has shown that if you have three of those factors, you're extremely high risk to have disabling Crohn's disease, right? So we use those all the time in clinic where we say, hey, you're 20, you've got, you know, perianal fistula, I'm going to start you on steroids. And that right there for us is a pivot point to say you need to go on top-down therapy. Um, so these are easy clinical parameters you can look at. The other thing we do, which is, I think, the most important thing is if your colonoscopy, if your endoscopy shows severe endoscopic lesions, right, it's deep ulcerations, this is really one of the strongest predictors of I'm not going to do well if you're not going to get me into remission. And you can look at it at eight years, two-thirds of these patients ended up with a colectomy. And this is Crohn's disease. So again, the whole point is with those three clinical factors and your endoscopy, I think you can really risk stratify these patients and figure out the majority of patients that you would say, you're high risk, we don't want to go to surgery, how do we prevent that? 
And so we want to maintain steroid free remission, and why? Um, well, we know that at one year, if you treat a Crohn's patient initially with steroids, right, this is out of the Olmstead County, so it's not the Mayo Clinic population, it's a general Olmstead County population. And at the end of the year, about one third are doing fine. Uh, another 28% are basically steroid dependent, and 40% have gone on to surgery. So again, steroids don't really change the outcome here, and in fact, it's probably one of the things that is the most dangerous medication we use, right? So this is out of, we've seen kind of part of this before. This is out of the treat registry, uh, Gary Lichtenstein and others. And basically, as I think Brian has shown us before, they're really, with infliximab, with azathioprine, there's some risk there. And as you go further out, you can see that for serious infections, infliximab does show up. But really what showed up very early was steroids and narcotics, steroids and narcotics. So if you're still on steroids, that's a risk factor for having a serious infection. Okay, what about death? Well, again, infliximab didn't show up as a risk factor for having mortality. Azathioprine did not, but steroids, steroids, steroids show up as mortality. So this is why we want to keep people off of steroids. So what about steroid sparing agents? Well, we know azathioprine, right? The original or the um, pivotal trial was 42 patients and basically induced with steroids, go on to azathioprine and at the end of the year, you've got 7% of people in remission on placebo and 42% on azathioprine. So we know azathioprine can be a steroid sparing agent. This is just one example of anti-TNFs, right? This is adalumumab, um, and we know that it's better than placebo at being a steroid-sparing agent. I think most of us believe the biologics are relatively steroid-sparing agents. So which steroid-sparing agent, right? So should we use thiopurine? Should we use a biologic? Well, again, when you start talking to a patient in clinic, you start saying, okay, well, you can, here's your medical options. And most of my patients, it's about safety. They go read the package insert, they go research it online, and they come back and say, well, yeah, I read this, that everyone dies <laughs> from a biologic. And we, re we really have to educate them on, be careful what you read about online. Um, so with regards to safety, I think the pendulum has really swung on azathioprine, thiopurine 6MP, um, that we know now that if you're on it for more than two years, you start to see increased risk of lymphoma, skin cancer, cervical cancer. But we also know that if you discontinue after a patient's been in remission, and we've heard this before, there is going to be a risk of flare. And so in my practice, at least, we kind of look at this and say, well, we don't really want to keep you on azathioprine forever. Um, and that might be different across the country. And so one of the questions that was brought up at lunch is, well, what about dose de-escalating azathioprine. And, you know, I've only seen a couple of studies out of Asia where they said, okay, we're going to dose de-escalate to basically half dose. And they did fine, meaning they didn't see a lot of um, flares by dose reducing to half the dose of a therapeutic dose of azathioprine. But again, there was no evidence that this reduces your risk of lymphoma, skin cancer, um, because that's always been a black and white phenomenon in studies, right? Are you on azathioprine? Are you not? It wasn't dose. It wasn't 6TG levels. And so there's no strong evidence that dose reducing azathioprine will actually improve safety. And again, the big ticket items are cancers with azathioprine. So I think Brian actually said this, thiopurines as a monotherapy should be moved. Um, there are safer regimens comp uh, when you look at the cancer standpoint. And oh, by the way, we know that biologics are more effective than azathioprine. So if we're, why would we use a monotherapy with an inferior drug that has a higher toxicity, and why wouldn't we use the, the more uh, efficient drug and the safer drug? So one of the things that comes up is cost, and <laughs> we could, if Miguel were here, I'm sure he would have an opinion on this, but at least in our practice, which is not an accountable care network, it's not a IBD home, Right, so all of our, well, majority of our patients are on private insurance, commercial payers, and so for the patients, right, that's what I'm concerned about, is their out-of-pocket costs. And so what, what do we know about the biologics? Where they're safer and more effective, we've talked about that. And while they, in theory, are more expensive, for the patients, it's often cheaper, right? If you go on adalumumab, it's usually $5 a month. The vast majority of my patients, they go to pick up their azathioprine prescription every month, 
it's more than $5 a month. So again, it could actually be cheaper for the patient. The society issue is a different conversation. Um, and sure, biologics tend to be a little more logistically difficult to obtain from insurance. People go from pills to injections, which they don't like, but that's not really a reason to avoid them. Um, having said that, that I don't use a lot of thiopurines in monotherapy, uh, we'll talk about combination. So again, why do we say biologics are superior? Well, we, we've, everyone's using very similar data and slides. You guys have seen this, that if you look at adverse events at one year of azathioprine versus infliximab versus combination, right, for serious infections, there's no difference in this group. This is just a year, um, but again, you can't show that there's increased toxicity. And in fact, if you really look at all of these adverse events, most of the serious infections were disease-related, suggesting that you're inadequately treating the aza and placebo group, and that's why they end up with these infections. So I would say that the current evidence regarding the safety of biologics compared to immune modulators, I don't think that's a reason to delay the use of biologic therapy. So we've talked about safety, and what about the outcomes, right? Because again, the safety conversation comes first, and then the efficacy conversation, at least in our clinic. This is why we want to put you on it. Here's the risks, here's the benefits. So again, we know, and these are sub-analyses, um, but you can avoid hospitalizations really quite early on, right? This is week two, you see the, the lines separate in terms of people in the trial that were on placebo versus on adalumumab, and within two weeks, you already start to see separation, and certainly at 12 months, there's a huge difference between the number of hospitalizations uh, based on uh, adalumumab versus placebo. So again, showing we can change this outcome. Um, surgical, right, so we don't want steroids. I think we've shown that these are steroids bearing agents. We don't want hospitalizations. Well, what about surgeries? Again, sub-analysis. Um, but you can see, even with this small number of surgeries, you can already see a separation of using a biologic versus placebo that we can keep people off the operating room table. So, again, I'm assuming moderate to severe Crohn's disease. Steve taught us that we really should be thinking about how we're divine, defining moderate to severe. Um, with previous or current steroid use, that's the group we're talking about here. And I would say short-term safety, right? Steroids, everyone has a patient with steroid side effects. Immunomodulators, well, 12% start having pancreatitis, nausea, vomiting, LFT abnormalities right from the get-go. So short-term immunomodulators, to me, are more difficult to tolerate. Biologics, on the other hand, during the induction period, short-term, really very few people have significant reactions. And if we're talking about long-term safety, again, steroids, 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 they're the worst thing we do. Immunomodulators, I think the cancer, while it's a relatively small risk, it makes it less safe than a long-term biologic. Um, Short-term response, we know that uh, steroids work quickly, immunomodulators take longer, biologics work quickly, okay? Response and remission. Well, if we're using endoscopic healing, steroids really give you very little endoscopic healing. Immunomodulators can, but biologics are superior to that in terms of mucosal healing. And if we talk about evidence, right, steroids and immunomodulators were from an era where we didn't do these large randomized trials with, you know, several hundred patients in each arm. So the data is less so than biologics. And the outcomes, we know that steroids are bad. Immunomodulators, I will not say don't change the outcome, but we know that biologics are probably better at changing the outcome. So given this evidence, there's growing interest, and you guys have seen this, right? This was um, this, the top-down versus step-up therapy, and step-up meaning you get a course of steroids when you're diagnosed with Crohn's. If you do well, you watch and wait, give them a second course of steroids, and at that point you say, well, we should put you on azathioprine or methotrexate, and then if you fail that, then we go to infliximab. The top-down was you have Crohn's moderate to severe, we're gonna go infliximab, azathioprine, and interestingly, which is, a, I think, a mostly a Euro European-centric thing, they then said, okay, once you got your induction, if you're in remission, we're going to withdraw the infliximab and give it to you what they called on-demand, right? So you flare, you get another dose, and if, you, and if you eventually don't do well in that, then you go to steroids. And this is, right, really a f reflection of what 
people are doing in practice. I'm going to step up. I'm going to give you steroids and wait and watch versus you've got risk factors. I'm going to put you directly on combination therapy. And again, you guys have seen this, that at week 14, there's a significant higher steroid free remission. Some people would say, well, you never put the one group on combination therapy on steroids, but that's the reality, right? That's the whole point of this. And again, at two years, you start to see these things start to come together. And the one thing I would say about this is, at least in our practice, we're not doing the withdrawal of the biologic. We might withdraw the immune suppressive, but it's the opposite of what happened here. And the reality is, and when you got out to two years, the majority of the patients in the blue, which was the step up, they're on infliximab doing okay. Um, and the other curve, they're still getting episodic infliximab. So again, I think we clearly know if you intervene early, you can avoid steroids. And this is another issue, right? We've seen this, again, this is a sub-analysis, but most of the trials, uh, pivotal trials, have been able to show this when they look at it, is if you wait one year, two years, five years, greater than five years, regardless of whether you're bio-naive or bio-experienced, you're already seeing this decline in response rates, right? So if you treat people within a year, you can get 90% of them into remission. Um, if you treat them at five years, you're down to about 60% of people will go into remission. So the longer we wait, the longer we delay, we actually may lose the window where our most effective therapies are gonna be helpful. So biologics, in my opinion, are clearly superior therapy with better safety profiles in thiopurine. And we really shouldn't be stepping through thiopurines, but should we combine them? And that's the SONIC trial, which you guys have seen several times today, which is, right, patients on azathioprine placebo versus infliximab plus placebo or combination therapy and follow them out for a year. And we know that, again, mucosal healing with combination is the best way, the best uh, therapy we have today, right? Combination of thiopurine plus a biologic, um, I guess we could debate on methotrexate in this situation, is clearly better at mucosal healing, which is really where the majority of us are going with when do we think of patients in remission. It's not that they feel well, their CRP is normal. Have you healed your colonoscopy? And then steroid-free remission, which is a clinical outcome, uh, again, combination therapy wins. And steroid-free remission, combination therapy wins. So again, to go back to the adverse events, because a lot of people would say, I think Brian said one plus one isn't necessary, is two, but it's one plus one minus one, right? So we don't see increasing toxicity. Um, now my personal take on this is, I don't really go past a year on azathioprine anymore. Occasionally we do, but for the most part, we then withdraw the azathioprine. Um, and so these are the adverse events of interest in Sonic, right? So there was one person on infliximab azathioprine with TB, two patients with colon cancer and azathioprine. I don't, I'm not saying azathioprine caused the colon cancer. There was a, the only death was from a colectomy patient who was only on azathioprine. I would say that maybe they would not have gone to colectomy if you'd given them combination therapy. And then there were no new signals of opportunistic infections, malignancies, or death at one year. So again, current evidence suggests combination of azathioprine and biologic is probably the most effective therapy for Crohn's. Um, other factors, and these are the ones that we really can't control, right? Out-of-pocket costs. Well, immunomodulators, if your patient has reasonable insurance, may actually be more expensive. Insurance approval, immunomodulators are easier to get than biologics, so I get that. Convenience, well, again, it depends on the patient and the specifics, right? Injection, infusion versus pills. And then really, how familiar comfort level for the physician. But these are kind of non-medical facts. So biologics with immunomodulators. Patients that have failed azathioprine, as Steve pointed out earlier, they don't appear to significantly benefit when you add a biologic on top of that. Um, but the short-term risk of this is low, right? So one year, it's low. And I think you've heard that most of our uh, speakers would say, yeah, I'll add a biologic to azathioprine, even though most of the data would say that's not going to improve your outcome. I think there's some subtlety in there with antibody levels and drug levels. Um, there may be some benefit long term, probably from reducing antibody levels and keeping drug levels slightly higher. And there may be a subgroup who might benefit from staying on long term combination. Aza naive patients 
uh, mo most effective therapy for them is going to be combined. That's a different story, right? They've never been on ASA. They clearly do better with both therapies. And there doesn't appear to be any increase in risk at 12 months. Uh, what's the long-term strategy with this longer than a year? We don't know. Uh, we tend not to continue the azathioprine. So combination therapy is the best therapy for Crohn's. Biologic is superior to azathioprine as a monotherapies, right? So if I had to choose one, you said you can't use combo, they won't take it. I would still choose the biologic over aza. Uh, but the vast majority of our practice is still aza plus a biologic, and then we talk about should we get rid of the azathioprine. And the risk of biologics is not greater. In fact, I would say it's lower than uh, azathioprine long term. And early intervention is the most likely to result in steroid-free remission. Again, this is not aggressive. This is appropriate early intervention. It will likely avoid and prevent complications. It will hopefully improve their quality of life, prevent hospitalizations, prevent surgery. And that's all I have to say. Leonard already admitted to me last night that he was going to lose because he was given the other side of the argument. I just want to preface the end of my talk with that. Thank you.